If you take your Bible tonight and turn over to the book of Galatians, and we were looking at chapter 3 last week, the first part of that chapter, and I want to take you to the second part of this chapter, and of course the first part, he introduces uh, the idea of the law and the idea of the promise to Abraham. And again, the whole premise of his argument is that these law keepers, so-called, these Judaizers, who totally emphasized the Jewish law to be completed, um, they came in and said that Paul was insufficient. What he had taught them of a gospel of pure grace was not enough to save them. It wasn't enough to keep them saved and not even enough if they had been saved to take them to the next level spiritually. Of course, Paul, greatly alarmed by that, comes and he defends his, uh, his own apostleship, not himself. He, didn't, he wasn't concerned about his own name, but his own uh, position that he was in as an apostle, he defends that. And then he goes right at the very argument that these men offer. You know, you will notice that many times when a person talks about the Bible, they sound very logical. But if you actually take that person to the Bible and point out what they're saying, the Bible will generally speak for itself. You know, it's remarkable sometimes when you hear people argue the Bible. They ever tried to witness to someone and they're highly intelligent and they've got all the answers. And as soon as you bring up an argument from the Bible, they say very piously and very proudly, well, now I've read the Bible. Well, isn't that interesting? You're probably lying to me anyway. But you say you've read the Bible as if they've read the whole thing. And since they read it one time, and they clearly know everything it's got to say. Anybody who would say, I've read the Bible, as is to indicate I've read it one time and I got it, tells me they never read the Bible. They don't understand how complex this book is. No, they may have cracked it open. They may have heard somebody read Psalm 23. They know just enough to get them in trouble. But you know, it's remarkable how a person can bring up an argument about the Bible, and they like to talk about it. But many times, if you simply just bring them down and say, well, now, what exactly, what passage are you referring to? Oh, well, I don't know exactly where it is. Well, what book is it in? Oh, there's more than one book? I didn't realize that. I mean, you know, there's a lot of ignorance out there about the Bible. Well, you know, here are these people that Paul were dealing with. They came in and sounded very impressive when they talked about the law of Moses. They sound very impressive when they showed all of the knowledge they had of the traditions and how important these things were. But when Paul lays this argument down, he goes back to the Bible and he says, look, they claim to believe Abraham as their father. Well, let me show you if they believe that, Abraham was never under the law. He never heard of the law of Moses. They go back to Father Abraham. Moses was way later. So let me talk to you about Abraham. And he emphasizes the promise. Now, the promise is in contrast to the law. That does not mean that the law and the promise were not, uh, they were not competitors in that sense, but the law and the promise were two different things for two different purposes. Look at um, Galatians chapter 3, and notice now in verse 17, he says, This I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, and of course he says he's talking about the law, which was 430 years after. Now, the 430 years, I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. It's actually a little bit of debate about the reference. We know God put it down, so we know it's accurate. Whether that was referring to the time that Jacob instructed his sons, um, where that 400 years of affliction and the 430 years that's mentioned in the book of Exodus, the starting point, it's not clear. We know God knows the starting point. And we know that certainly when Paul wrote it again under inspiration of God, it's accurate. But the point was not that uh, when it started, but he was saying it was so long afterward, 430 years, you could say at least afterwards, that the law was given. I mean, you remember the Jews, uh, we know they were in affliction because it says they came out the self-same day, 430 years to the day when they came out, they didn't have the law yet. So the whole time, just in the time that they were in Egypt, they had never heard of the law of Moses. Well, now go before that. Jacob's family, of course, they were very small at that point, but uh, Jacob had never heard of a law. Um, none of his sons of the 12 tribes have heard of a law. So the law was totally new, so it's given. So he says again in verse 17, 
that which was 430 years after cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. You know, what would it mean if God came in, he had given Abraham this promise, I'm going to bless him that blesseth thee, curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Not only that, he promised him you're going to have a seed that's going to exceed this and so forth. If he gave that promise and then later gave a law that nullified the promise. So if every Jew was saying, okay, we look back to the promise of Abraham. God's going to bless. We're going to be a blessing to the world, which we know that blessing is Christ. Christ is going to come through the Jew. So we looked at that promise, but then Moses comes along and says, lay that aside. I've got something new for you here. It's the Ten Commandments. It's the law, not just the Ten, but that encapsulates all the Ten Commandments. Uh, he says, I've got these rules for you, so no longer are you under promise. You know what that would imply? It would imply that God made a mistake. You know, I'd start this thing off with promise. That's clearly not going to work. Look how these people are living. Look what they're doing. They're living just like the heathen nations. Forget the promise. Here's what you'd better do. But God never made a mistake. Now, God did have a reason for giving the law that actually did not nullify the promise. But you know what it did to the promise? It enhanced it. It actually made us see why that promise was so precious. Now, Abraham probably could have heard that promise and said, God's going to make me a great nation. That sounds, I like that thought. I'm going to be a great nation. My nation is going to be a blessing to the world. And anybody that blesses me, he's going to bless. And all the nations are going to be blessed through me. What a tremendous promise. But he had no concept of how much that promise this world was going to need. I'm sure Abraham could have viewed it as, I'm going to benefit from the promise. My seed is going to benefit from the promise. And a side effect will be the nations of the earth will benefit from it. Actually, the opposite was true. The nations of the world were going to be a recipient of that promise. And a byproduct was Abraham and his seed were going to receive blessing from it. Because Jesus came to this world not just to save the Jew. He came through the Jew to save the world. Now, that promise was not nullified. So, here's the question. It says in verse 18, If the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? Now, these uh, people that come in and confuse these Galatians emphasized one thing, the law. They didn't emphasize the promise. They didn't emphasize faith. They didn't emphasize grace. Just the law. Now, they didn't mind the, you know, if they wanted to take the good and leave the bad, they'd say, well, fine. If you want to believe faith in Christ, grace, believe he's the Messiah, that's wonderful. But here's what God's really concerned about. You know what inevitably happens is when somebody tries to mix law and grace, they don't mix. But by nature of the fact that law is doing grace is achieved through faith, you're always going to err toward the law. You know, there's uh, people that believe you have to be baptized in water to be saved. Now, you know what I find my experience is, you know, if you ask them theologically, how do you get saved? They say, you believe in Jesus. I guess they say that's 50%. And then you get baptized in water. I don't know if they'd place a percentage on it, but both are equally necessary. I mean, you've got to trust Jesus. That's great. You did that. You've got to be baptized. What my experience is, I find, though, that if a person will just get baptized, they feel pretty good about it. If they'll just do that, because I can see that. That's tangible. They claim to believe Jesus, but hey, I saw them go through the baptismal water. I can put my hand on that. I know they got saved because of that. And obviously, that's a work. They're adding a work to salvation. On the other hand, what does grace say? Grace says you get a guy genuinely born again, you're not going to have any problem getting him baptized. Because grace is going to want him, he's going to want to be obedient to God and take that step of obedience. Now, where did the law serve? Why did God even bother giving it? If it seems to fly in contrast to promise, God didn't change his mind. Well, he explains here what it does. It says, wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come, to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, what did it do? Did, did the law cause sin to be created? 
No sin already existed. Matter of fact, hold your finger right here if you need to mark it or something. Go back to Romans chapter 5 for a moment. A very similar uh, statement is being made here. But notice when he talks about the origin of sin. If you look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. The Bible says, Wherefore is by one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Now, we could spend some time preaching on that one passage, but I want you to notice the two words that are used there is sin and transgression. You see, before the law came, sin was in the world. But where no law is, sin was not imputed because they had not sinned after the likeness of Adam's, not sin, but transgression. Now, that well defines what those two words mean because sin means we missed the mark. God has a standard. Now, it's very easy to find God's standard. You don't even need uh, Moses' law to know what his standard is. It's perfection. I mean, it's always been perfection. Now, it was pretty easy for Adam to know what perfection was. God says, Adam, you're already innocent. Don't even have a sin nature. Here's the one thing you have to do is don't disobey me in one area. Here's one tree. You know what Adam did? He disobeyed him in that one area. You know, technically there was a law. Now, it wasn't the law of Moses. There was a law for Adam. In the day you eat this tree, you're going to die. Well, you know what happened from Adam to Moses? Death reigned. Now, had there been no sin in the world, death wouldn't have reigned. What brought death? Sin, missing the mark. That's, that really speaks to our nature. We're naturally short. In fact, skip down. You go back to Galatians 3. Look at verse 22, uh, verse 22. But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus might be given to them that believe. You know what the conclusion of the Scripture is? Is that we all come short of what God has demanded. That's all that really matters. You know why there's no difference? Now, we often confuse sin and transgression. And they're not, they can be used generally as the same thing. But the transgression was Adam heard God say, don't eat this tree. And he rebelled against it, and he ate the tree. Sin is just missing the mark. Now, he didn't have a sin nature. At that point, he hadn't even missed the mark. But he went against what God told him to do. Well, you know, from that point to Moses, as far as the world was concerned, rather than a handful of individuals, God didn't really tell the world anything. He didn't give them any particular commandments that here are my commandments. Now, he generally gave Noah a covenant to live by. But as far as strict prohibition of moral elements, they were not given until the, the law came along. You say, well, good. That means there was no sin in the world. No, there's plenty of sin. People were dying constantly because of sin. But what the law did, it did not make me a sinner, but it made it evident to me that I am. You see, I could have, you know, when Cain killed his brother, why do you think he hit him? Why did Cain hide his brother? I mean, the guy got in my way. I didn't like him. I killed him. I don't, is God okay with that? No, he knew God wasn't okay with it. God hadn't really even said, thou shalt do no murder. He knew he shouldn't have murdered his brother. He knew he missed the mark. But what about when Moses comes along and says, thou shalt not kill? Now, people often say, you know, I try to do the best I can. You know what? That's a lie. We don't do the best we can. We could do better than we do. We don't want to do it. You know, somebody who says, well, I think I've done about the best I could, you, your conscience doesn't really believe that. You don't believe you've done the best you could, but even if you did, it wouldn't be good enough. Now, what was the law for us? Really, very simply, it, for all those years, 
took the promise. God said that the world was going to be blessed through Abraham. Well, yeah, that's wonderful. The world is going to be blessed through Abraham. But all of a sudden, the law comes along, and what does it show me? The world desperately needs that promise. They need Jesus. You know, if I'd never been taught the Bible, and I knew nothing about it, was ignorant of what God said, it might not bother me that homosexuality is glorified. There might be something in my conscience, but my conscience could be seared, especially if I wasn't involved in it myself. I, you know, well, why not? I mean, I had a neighbor across the street one day. He's not saved. He just, we were just discussing things, and, and to him, of course, he, he didn't live that lifestyle, and he says, well, you know, I kind of thought about that. I guess really uh, everybody's got a right to love everybody who they want to love. See, that's ignorance of the Scripture. If I didn't have what God wrote down, I might say, well, man, you got a point there. I guess that's pretty logical. I, I can't really argue with that, but, but I can because I know what God says. If I didn't know what God says, and it's really the same issue, I wouldn't really have a problem if a man went out and cheated on his wife. I didn't do it. My conscience doesn't bother me. He did. I mean, that might be something I don't really want to do, but if I didn't know the Bible, it might not alarm me that our culture was immoral. You know, uh, if a person, uh, short of killing somebody, we feel like, well, that's decisive. You know, they've taken a life. But really, um, if I, a man went off and stole something, he got away with it. He really didn't hurt anybody. The guy that had it probably didn't deserve to have it anyway. If you didn't have a Bible, you say, I just don't believe that anybody would ever be okay with that. Basically, that's what the liberal philosophy is today. Rob from one person, give it to another because they did not deserve it. Now, you understand, if I didn't have a Bible that says it's wrong to take something that's not yours, I might be okay with it if other people were doing it. You know, it wouldn't bother me. Let me tell you why that you, you take the law of Moses and you put that thing up on a wall and people have to walk by and they see thou shalt not and thou shalt. It is like pouring salt on a slug. I mean, they just don't want it there as a mirror pointing back to them, showing that God must be number one, that God expects to be honored, His name is not to be misused, that you cannot commit adultery, you can't even covet in your heart something that is not yours, you cannot tell a lie. You know what it did for all these hundreds of years? It made people constantly see we, we need somebody to do something about sin. Now, religion can't help with it. Religion's been trying. All kinds of religion. Man is incurably religious. I mean, the first full-fledged organized religion was Cain. He had the fruit of his own hands, his labor. He said, I believe God will be pleased with this. And he brought the fruit of his hands, and God condemned it. And false religion has done the same thing ever since. Here is the works that I believe that will impress. It may not be Jehovah God, but whatever God they want to impress, this will do it. Religion has failed miserably. Can't deal with sin. The law simply is a loudspeaker that constantly yells out, we need the promise. We need a Savior. And the Savior is the only one that can take care of it. So what did it serve? Well, it served a pretty good purpose. I mean, all you need to do is look at the place in the time of Jesus. When Jesus came along, they didn't line up with God's law. They changed the law. See, God says, honor your father and mother. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm having a hard time. I've got this big chunk of cash over here. You say, honor my father and mother. And this was a day, of course, there was no nursing home. There was no uh, social security, and much of it now. Uh, there was no, no way to take care of people. Um, afterwards, the family was going to do that. So part of honoring your father and mother was making sure they were taken care of. And they got this big chunk of cash. But man, that's going to take a lot of investment to take care of my parents. I know what I'll do. The law tells me, here's what I'm supposed to do, but I don't like the law. I'm going to change it. I'm dedicating my money to God. Now, if I dedicate it to God, hey, I'm sorry, parents. Um, that's, that's money dedicated to God. Of course, I can still use it. I, you know, I need it. I'll use it for something, but that's put away for God. I mean, that's what Jesus condemned them for. You didn't line up with the law. You changed it to make you fit what you want to do. And, you know, you'll find that people today who are convinced, and I'm not saying their motive is wrong. I'm not saying they're not mistaught, but there are people that think that what they do is going to make them lose their salvation. I got it by grace. I'm going to lose it by law. They will change the law. So how long have you kept it? 
well, I'm saved, and so far I hadn't lost it. I'm hanging on to it. So you're telling me that you've been saved all these years, you've never lost it. You mean you haven't sinned? Well, I'm not saying I hadn't made mistakes. No, God doesn't have mistakes. There's no mistakes. You sinned. You transgressed God's law. I mean, you have to redefine what sin is, don't you? Well, I'm just saying if a guy goes out and commits adultery, drops out of church, and living a drunk, he can't be saved. And I'm telling you, if that's the standard, and a guy one time loses his temper out of the will of God, then he lost it, if that's what it's based on. But it's just not based on that. It's based on the grace of God. Hey, I'm thankful today that I don't uh, have to wonder, man, what if I did X? Would I still be saved? I'm saved by the grace of God. Now, he gives this law, and then, of course, he deals with the promise. Now, let's back up and notice the contrast of a promise. Go to chapter uh, 3 and verse 19. It says, Wherefore serveth the law? Then notice at the end. The law, it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, I'll admit to you, that's a tough passage. Um, I've read a couple of different thoughts on it. A couple of them make sense. A couple of them are way out in left field. So I'll just give you the one I think makes more sense. Um, to me, and if you view this, it really makes sense that God gave the law to Moses. And, and I don't know that you could find this in the Old Testament, but clearly this is the implication. God gave it to an angel. An angel gave it to Moses. Now, the angel of the Lord we consider to be the Lord Jesus Christ. But either way, in the Old Testament... The angel of the Lord met with him at the burning bush and so forth. So God to the angel, to Moses, to the people. I mean, God's at least removed by two. At least from the angel to Moses to the people. So he's saying when the law came, it came through several mediators to get to where it was going. Now, what about when he gave Abraham the promise? How'd that happen? He met with him directly. Now, that doesn't imply that when God told the angel and the angel told Moses and Moses told the people that there was any in inaccuracies along the way, no inaccuracies, but how much emphasis did God put on a covenant that he personally came down and told Moses himself? I mean, that's a significant... Uh, you remember in chapter 19 of the book of Genesis when he came to see Moses, he and two angels came along. He sent the two angels on Old Sodom. And the L-O-R-D in capital letters stayed and communed with Abraham. I know him. He shall command his children and his household after him. They may keep the way of the Lord. I mean, that was God meeting with Abraham in the similitude of a man, but it was God that met with him. And in each case, directly gave him this promise. Now, notice, if you would, in verse 20. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. You know, typically, if you're going to make a covenant with someone, it takes two people. You know, you and I are going to make a covenant. And the covenant, typically, is conditional. You agree to do your part, I agree to do my part. We've covenanted it together to do this. But God made a covenant, and there was no reason to put Abraham involved in the covenant. You know all Abraham did as far as his part in the covenant? To enjoy it? The covenant was what it was. But what did Abraham do to enjoy that covenant? He believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He didn't have a part in it. God is one. Matter of fact, um, we're going to have to hurry here, but look over at Hebrews chapter 6, just a few pages over in your Bible. This is referred to again by Paul in Paul's anonymous letter to the Hebrews. But if you look in Hebrews chapter 6 and look at verse 13. It says, For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, multiplying I will multiply thee. And then, of course, Abraham patiently endured, and then look at uh, verse 17, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto his heirs of promise the immutability or the unchangeableness of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. I mean, God made a promise with Abraham, typically, before uh, in the Old Testament, you know, I will swear by 
God's name. I'll swear by what something greater than themselves. But God, who is he going to swear by? He made an oath and he said, I swear by myself. And Abraham didn't even have a side to it. Now that's the promise. What happened at the law? God said, I bear you on eagle's wings, brought you unto myself, therefore keep my covenant, do what I've commanded you to do. And the people said, all that you have spoken, we will do. A two-sided covenant. Did God ever fail on his side? No. But you don't have to read many verses before they failed on their side. As a matter of fact, before Abraham could get back down and tell them what God had to say about it, they were already worshiping the golden calf. They failed on their side of it. Now, he's painting a picture here that the law really does this. It takes a sinner and it drops an arm down on this side and it ta- they, the sinner skirts out and says, okay, no problem. I, I really can't, uh, I can't live that moral life, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give a bunch of money to charity and he throws another hand down on this side and then he throws another excuse and God stops him right here. And another excuse, and God stops him right here, and the law just keeps closing him in and closing him in until the law's got him boxed in in a corner. And there's nowhere else to go. And then the promise comes along. Here's the promise. Had you rather get boxed in by the law? You know what? The the world and the Jewish nation was simply a message to the rest of the world. The law simply told them, this this God's, God's standard is too high. I need something different. And there is something different. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's the one that provides the way for the law to be met in full. Very quickly, read if you would verse 24. Wherefore, which is the explanatory statement, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. So very simply, what is Paul saying to these people? He paints this picture. so obvious, so logical. He said, here's the purpose of the law to paint you in a corner, to show you that you needed something, totally had a purpose. It had a beginning and it had an end. Now, if the purpose of the law was to bring you to Jesus, to point to you that you need him, to show you that he is the only way, then obviously when Jesus came, what did that do to the law? It ended its purpose as far as it was fulfilled. Now, today, does the law have a purpose? For individual sinners, it has the same purpose. It paints God's moral code to show a sinner he needs Jesus. I mean, do we still preach, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt have no other gods before thee? Sure we do. We preach on sin. Do we ever say, if you will get rid of your adultery, if you'll live a better life, clean up your act, try to straighten up, then God will be okay? No, that'd be heresy. No. We say, you're hopeless because of your sin, Let me tell you why you need Jesus. And that's what the law did. We're going to stop there. Lord, how we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the law of God that's holy and just and good and shows us exactly what you are and how holy you are and how unjust we are. But we thank you today for the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ that you offer it in grace by faith. And Lord, we thank you for the resurrection that you've accomplished that gives us, Lord, the the justification if we'll simply receive you. Thank you for your love to us. Lead tonight, we pray, as we end the service. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand and sing 372 tonight. As we stand and sing 372, that will dismiss our service.